Can you hear me? Oh, good. Then perhaps I can try and get you a bit worried about things that have worried me for a very long time. I've been worried about the decline of reason and the resurgence of unreason. Now for quite a long time. This is something that's quite universal. It's there in every country of the world, but more in some and less in the others. It's something which has enormous implications for the future of human existence and for the resolution of our problems. Let me back up a little bit. About 300 years ago, Europe went through a phase which was called the Age of Reason. It emerged from darkness, from the fight against superstition, and this fight then led to the birth of modern science. Modern science which gives us everything that we have today in our modern world. But more than that, it gave us an opportunity to look at how humans should relate with other humans. And that culminates in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which I think is absolutely the most fantastic document that's ever been written. But now, reason is under attack for, from many quarters. And I could give you example after example. But let me start with uh, something that a lot of people over here might know about. So this is something like uh, three years ago. A man by the name of Aga Vakar Pathan, he said he had invented a car that would run only on water. So no petrol, no gas, nothing. All you would need is bottled water, you know, Nestle stuff. And with that, you could drive for hundreds of kilometers. Now, there was great excitement in the country. You had newspapers, you had television channels, which just did nothing but cover this. You had the great scientists of this country endorse it. The man drove his car before 200, scient or peop 200 people who had degrees in science. I don't necessarily call them scientists. And they all clapped. We had um, endorsements from our great nuclear heroes, Dr. A.Q. Khan and Dr. Samar Mubarakman. And they said, this is wonderful. There were three meetings of the cabinet. The government of Pakistan held three cabinet meetings in which they discussed what they would need to do now that this car was just uh, going to be everywhere because we wouldn't need to import oil. The television anchors, they were worried. There's a very popular anchor, Talat Hussain. He uh, asked his viewers, he said, uh, you know, now that we've got this national treasure over here, how are we going to prevent him from being kidnapped by the Americans? <laughs> and so this went on and on. Well, one of those anchors invited me, Ahmed Mir, and in that I had a confrontation with that man. And he said, I didn't know any physics. I said, you are a fraud, you ought to go to jail. And I must say, my, my, fam my friends and family didn't like that at all. They said, you should use such strong language. As it turned out, it wasn't particularly strong because the man had been indicted for armed robbery some years ago. <laughs> anyway, the whole thing collapsed. But now let's reflect upon why this man achieved such status in such short time and why everybody wanted to believe him? The answer is, we love magic. We love magical solutions to our problems. So science asks you to reason, to look for evidence, to patiently sift through the evidence, the facts. But when you have magic, 
Magic says in a poof like that, you can solve all your problems. And so that's the reason why we had this national embarrassment. Now let me tell you how the exercise of a rather simple reason could have helped us avoid this. Well, first of all, there's an obvious question to ask, that hey, um, how come it's only in Pakistan that this water car is going to be on the streets? Didn't anyone in the United States and Japan in China or any other country think of it? All right, that would have been a straightforward question. It's one we should have asked ourselves. We could have also asked ourselves, has there been an attempt like this made before? Just go to Google, put in water car. And if you do that, by the way, you'll find dozens and dozens of hits and you'll find that they all lead to some kind of fraud. A third exercise of reason would have simply been this, that go back to your eighth grade chemistry book and ask what happens when you pass carbon dioxide through lime water. You know, it turns milky. Okay. So if you were to take the exhaust from that and pass it through lime water, it would turn milky. It will tell you that what he's saying is wrong because if he's actually burning something, which he is, I haven't looked at the car, but I, there's no other way because it violates the laws of thermodynamic, you would have found that it would turn milky. So reason could have saved us over there. Let me now change gears altogether. Go from physics to politics. We are here in Islamabad, a city where for the last two months we have seen a major portion of the city occupied, a dharna. It's initiated by a very popular political leader who says that he can end corruption in 90 days. He's made this statement again and again, and there are lots of people who believe him. And everybody over here, you and me, wants to get rid of corruption. And if he can do it in 90 days, well, why not? It's even better than the water car. <laughs> now, <laughs> now, let's just think about things just a little bit. In 90 days, it is very possible that this great leader could drag our present government leaders and the past ones over hot coals and make up, cough up all those millions, billions which they've stashed away in Swiss banks. I don't doubt that. He could. could. I mean, tighten the screws and you can get anything done. Fine, fine. I'd love to see that happen. But... Let's go to the next stage. Is corruption only the corruption of your political opponents or is it something that is endemic within the society? Your policeman is corrupt. Your patwari, the guy who does the land records, is corrupt. Your judges are corrupt and we know it and no contempt of court intended, but we know they're corrupt. We know that contractors are corrupt and my goodness, you look at the construction in Islamabad and you see how the roads have been dug up and you see that you can't get from one place to the other and why? Because somebody's eaten up the money, all right? And it's not just now, it's been happening for a very long time. Some 20 years ago, I got a a frantic appeal from the faculty at Kherpur University, which is in Sindh, as you know. And they said, please come and visit us at our new campus. There's something horrible we have to show you. And so I went there. And there my colleagues took me to the new campus of Kherpur University that had been constructed at a distance of about 30 miles from the old campus. It had already something like 28 buildings constructed. It looked utterly desolate. They told me that the buildings are collapsing even before classes have started over there. And they took me around over there and I thought I'd walked into a graveyard of buildings. 
You know about the Leaning Tower of Pisa? That leaned over for centuries and is still leaning over. Here, some of those buildings leaned over and they didn't last. They just collapsed into rubble. The auditorium uh, collapsed into rubble. And so this entire campus, this is unbelievable, of 28 buildings built at some horrendous cost, collapsed. Well, what happened? The contractor was taken to court. There he made the plea. He said, it rained so much, the ground settled, so the buildings turned over. And he said, it's, look, I am, it wasn't me who did it, it's God. It was an act of God. And now, here is where exercise of rationality, of reason is needed. Because look, we want to get rid of corruption, you, me, everyone. But it has to be a systemic process. It has to be engineered. We have to change social relations. We have to change the, how kinship matters in our society, etc., etc. There is no flash solution. Let's not look for the water car here. Pakistan didn't invent reason, it didn't invent unreason. It all started in Europe. And Europe, after the age of reason, went into an, un into an age of unreason as well. And you don't see it any better than, in, than the beginning of World War I. Why did World War I come about? Because nationalism had come to take a grip upon the minds of peoples everywhere in Europe. If you were German, if you were French, if you were British, you belonged to your country. You did not belong to humanity, you belonged to your country. And so, the intense nationalist passions that were stirred up by appeal again and again to nationalism led to the most ferocious battles in history. The Battle of the Somme, this is 1916, I can't remember the exact day. 70,000 people dead. And these were British soldiers on horses and cavalry and rushing into the mouths of German machine guns and barbed wire being mowed down. That war led to, that First World War led to 10 million dead. The Second World War to many times that, etc. I have a Danish physicist colleague, John Avery, who told me a wonderful proverb. He said, when the flag is unfurled, all reason lies in the trumpet. Ah, that trumpet you hear twice a day at Vaga, when the flag is furled and when the flag is lowered. And thousands of people go to watch the flag lowering ceremony. They have peacocks strutting with turbans on their head and they shoot their legs so high in the sky <laughs> that they suffer from bruised muscles. They do it every day, month after month, year after year, without respite. And you know what happened three days ago, uh, three weeks ago. When that suicide bomber came along, blew himself up and took 60 lives with him and wounded hundreds more. Well, what happened the next day? The same crowds there to cheer them again. What does reason say? Reason says, you peacock on this side, you peacock on that side. Looking at you too, if you didn't have different uniforms, I wouldn't be able to tell the difference. It's just accidental that you happen to be born on the Indian side and you on the Pakistani side. It's, we are the same people. We are divided by a territorial boundary. And now that we have nuclear weapons, we're willing to annihilate each other. 
if reason were to prevail, it would be so simple. I didn't choose my parents, you didn't choose yours. The guy on that side of the border didn't choose his parents. In fact, I don't know anyone who's chosen his parents, chosen his country, chosen his religion. And so if it is all accidental, reason tells you, tells us all, that these fights are no fights. They are irrational. I'm going to end, fortunately, on a note of hope. So Europe went through these absolutely terrible times. You had the beautiful cities of Europe, Dresden, Berlin, London, all of them, some of them more than others, bombed from the skies. Hundreds of thousands dead in a single bombing. That night of Dresden killed 200,000 people, more than in the bombing of Hiroshima, because the, the air was 